Okay, folks, so our next speaker is Hernan Garcia from uh, Berkeley, and he's going to be telling us about the segmentation, uh, vertebrate segmentation. Go ahead and take it away. Can people hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Excellent. All right, well, thank you for having me here today. It's already been a, a great start to the morning. And so I'm, I'm, this is, I'm just starting to talk about this. It's like a, the first foray in my, of my lab into vertebrate development. So I'm very excited to share this new work with you guys. I'm very much look forward to uh, getting your feedback. Um, hold on a sec, what I need to do. There you go. Okay, so so as a, as a reminder, like we, we live in the genome age. And what that means is that I can grab the any organism, se sequence its genome, find out where transcription factors bind, and even map gene regulatory networks. Okay, but despite having, for example, the arrangement of binding sites that mediates decisions such as body plant segmentation, limb development, or hematopoiesis, you cannot use this knowledge of binding sites and network connections in order to predict cellular decision making and pattern formation. And what I'm going to try to convince you today is that collecting this, this, this maps of connections and, and binding sites is not enough to reach a predictive understanding of cellular decision making. And that instead, you need, we need to augment our knowledge to include, for example, information about space, time, concentrations, effectors, and, and forces. Okay. So the way we do this in my lab is by engaging in the dialogue between theory and experiment that has been the hallmark of the physics approach for the last 500 years. What I mean by that is we grab a cartoon models or qualitative models of biological function that you might find in textbooks, and we turn them into precise mathematical statements that predict, for example, how the output rate of transcription is dictated by the input concentration of activator. Okay, And then we go into the lab and measure this input, measure the output in order to test the model. And the idea is that we're dealing with a cycle, that theory is there to make experimentally testable predictions. Experiments are explicitly designed to test those predictions and to inform the next round of theoretical modeling. And the claim, and hopefully I'll, you, you'll be convinced by the end of this talk, is that this sort of dialogue doesn't just isn't just a means towards reaching predictive understanding, but also can be used as a microscope into molecular mechanism. Basically, you can use theory to see things that you couldn't even see with the fanciest super resolution microscope out there. Okay, so over the years, I've, I've you know I've been very excited about it, engaging in this dialogue between theory and experiment. In in my PhD, I did this in the context of bacteria. We made a bunch of predictions about this input output function that I'm showing you on the right as a function of the number placement and affinity of transcription factor binding sites. And when then we developed technology that made it possible to test those predictions. And to a large extent, we showed that from DNA sequence we can predict these input output functions. Then for my postdoc, I decided to take on the challenge of pursuing this sort of, of these sorts of questions, but in the context of a multicellular organism, in the context of embryonic development. And I focused on the fruit fly because there's so much known about the genes, connections, the, the molecular players, and it's also so easy to image and to control its genome. So during that time, we developed the tools that allowed us to engage in the dialogue between theory and experiment. And now in my lab at Berkeley, uh, we, we engage in this dialogue in the context of the fruit fly as a, as a main player, but we've been expanding our research portfolio in the context of collaborations. And one of the most exciting new developments we've had is, is studies in the context of zebrafish that I'm gonna to talk to you about today. So, but let's take a step back and you know, what does it mean to enable physical biology? What does it mean to engage in this dialogue in the context of multicellular organisms? You know, what are the challenges? What do you need to get done in order to, to, to engage in this dialogue? Well. First, you need to measure the input output functions that we're trying to predict. Okay, so you need those sorts of technologies. Second, I talked to you about uh, mathematical size and theoretical model, uh, cartoon models, but first you need the qualitative model of molecular action. And for example, even though we know a bunch of identities of activators and repressors, and maybe where they bind on the DNA, we know surprisingly little about what they do once they're bound to the DNA. And finally, we need to derive and test mole uh, theoretical models of cellular decision making. And these three challenges represent the three threats that have been uh, that, that, that have constituted the the, uh, the characterized research in my lab, where we have first um, a, a threat that is dedicated to developing technologies to visualize the processes of the central dogma in single cells of living embryos, where we use also physics as a microscope in order to reveal molecular mechanism by doing in vivo biochemistry, and finally this is all put in the service of realizing physical biology of developing embryos. And over the last few years, we've had great fun thinking about all of the, all, along, uh, along all of these lines. And today, hopefully, the work I'm going to show you will, will feature 
uh, will give you an, uh, an idea of how we like how we implement each one of these threads in our research. In particular, today I'm I'm interested in, in understanding the process of somitogenesis. This is the process by which we rhythmically add the precursors to our vertebrate. Like all of, all vertebrates do it this way. Okay, so you can see this is a zebrafish that is growing, and you can see how as development progressed, the vertebrae appeared one by one. And we're going to look at this movie again in a in a little. Oh, let me put the laser part. Okay, so. The, the work I'm going to show you today was initially launched in my lab by Elizabeth Eck, who was a biophysics PhD student. She's now a postdoc at Yale and has been now taken over by Brandon Schloman and Bruno Moretti, two amazing postdocs. And this is all done in collaboration with Andy Oates at EPFL and also Lloyd Royer at the Biohub in San Francisco. And the talk today is going to be divided in, in four very short sections. Okay, First, I'm going to introduce you to the technologies we had to develop in order to, uh, to measure the process of the central dogma invertebrates as a means to engage in the theory experiment dialogue. Then, th what that's going to show us is that we're going to discover using those technologies that somitogenesis, this, this process of, of adding vertebrate precursors, is driven by what is, looks like stochastic transcriptional bursts. What we're going to then look at is the fact that despite this burst seemingly being seemingly stochastic, we're going to discover that they're sufficiently coordinated at the tissue level in order to give you robust tissue-wide oscillations of gene expression that dictate uh, the developmental, uh, that dictate the, the specification of somites. And finally, with these technologies, we're going to be able to go back to the theory and what we're going to show is that with the, you know, that that basically we're going to break the current model of how these how somitogenesis is driven, and we're going to propose a new model and also new experiments that, that we're currently carrying out in order to test that model. Okay. And so, so yeah, so as I mentioned, you know, we're going to be focused on somitogenesis, and you see in this movie how somites are being rhythmically added as you go, as, as the development goes. And also you can see how this delta is growing in size. Okay. So, and this, again, this is the way all of us develop. Okay. And this is pretty cool in the sense that it's one of those examples of theory being ahead of the experiment. So Cook and Zeeman figure out what the principles behind somitogenesis were before we figure out what the molecular players were. And here's the idea. What you see here is the pre-somitic mesoderm. This is this area here. This is the chick embryo. But if I took a zebrafish embryo, a picture of a zebrafish embryo, you wouldn't be able to tell that easily. So what they proposed is that there, is a, there are oscillations propagating from the and from the posterior to the anterior of the tail band. But once those oscillations hit a, hit a so-called determination front, they get fixed. And the concept is that if they get, they get fixed on a, on, a, on a peak of the oscillation, that is the anterior part or posterior part of the somite. And on the, on the, if they get fixed on the trough, that's the anterior part of the somite. Further, what they also realize is that if this determination front moves also as the tail band grows, then you're going to get a rhythmic specification of these somites. You know, a way to a better way to see this is through a movie. This is a movie put together by Andy Oates and Luis Morelli. Uh, and here what you're going to see in blue is the gene exper are the gene expression oscillations. And you're going to see how the end of the embryo is moving with respect to the determination front. And every time an oscillation hits the determination front, you get a, you get a somite specific. Okay. And you know, I don't want to go a lot into the details of, of the of these of the, the propagation of these oscillations and the determination front. But just to give you some sense of, of what we're dealing with, you know, like the difference between, for example, a short-bodied vertebrate like a fish and a long-bodied vertebrate like a snake is has to do with the speed of this determination front and the frequency of the oscillations. Okay. So what I want to focus today is on the oscillations themselves. And what people figure out is that these oscillations are driven by a given a repressor called HER1. This, this is probably going to be one of the only protein names I'm going to mention today. And the idea is that HER1 dimerizes with itself, then represses itself. Okay, so you get this negative feedback loop. And we know that under certain, a certain parameter regime, negative feedback loops can support oscillations. Okay, so we knew that there should be some genes that oscillate. That was the hypothesis. And People like Andy Oates, like Sharon Amaker in zebrafish, and also like Alexander Leila and, and Olivier Porcoy and others in, in mammals, managed to see these oscillations. So, for example, here we're looking at the at the zebrafish embryo, and we're going to focus on the tail band, okay? And here there's a, this gene HER1 that is labeled with Venus. And what I want you to notice is how oscillations start from the, the tail band, and they propagate up, and they stop. And where they stop, if you can see that there's some, there's like little undulations here, those correspond to each one of the somites as they're being formed. Okay, so 
the cool thing is that, you know, there's this negative feedback loop model and this negative feedback loop model predicts that the genes should indeed oscillate in a smooth fashion. And this is what people like Andy see, right? So here you see the oscillations as a function of time of HER1 in an individual cell. I'm not gonna bother too much with thinking about the amplitude change. I just want you to know is these oscillations are how nicely and smooth they are, okay? But this model also makes another prediction. And the prediction is that the transcription rate, the amount of RNA produced, the rate of RNA produced, also will oscillate in a smooth fashion. And yet, so far we had had no tools to be able to measure how the RNA, the RNA dynamics that lead to these oscillatory protein dynamics. And this is not a trivial question. Right? And why is that? Imagine that your transcription rate oscillates in a sinusoidal fashion. What would be the resulting protein dynamics? Well, I can plug these protein dynamics into a model of the central dogma, I account for transcription, the translation, degradation, and everything. And you can predict what the protein uh, dynamics will be. And indeed, you get smooth protein oscillations. But I could also have square-like protein oscillations in the, in the RNA, and that would lead to basically the same uh, protein oscillations. So the point is that given the protein dynamics, you cannot infer the RNA dynamics. Okay, so you need to look. And the way we decided to look is by repurposing some technology that we've been uh, developing in the context of the fruit fly called the MS2 system. So here's how this works. We're gonna grab the HER1 gene and we're gonna add a little sequence of that gene that when transcribed forms a loop. The loop is recognized by a binding protein fused to GFP such that every nucleus in the embryo will have a little spot of fluorescence and the fluorescence of that spot will be proportional to how many polymerase molecules are actively transcribed in the gene. So this is what it looks like when you put it all together. In magenta, you see the individual nuclei. In green, first you see these weird waves that are moving across the field of view. This, is, this has to do with an experimental artifact that skin cells are being labeled. We're gonna remove them computationally. What I want you to focus is on the little spots that appear in each one of these nuclei and how they're turning on and off, on and off, right? We're seeing these oscillations. This is the first time anybody can see transcriptional dynamics in single cells of a vertebrate, a vertebrate animal, okay? And so the cool thing is that now we can use these tools to focus on an individual spot and ask what are the transcriptional dynamics of a single cell? And what I'm gonna show you next is that those dynamics, instead of being smooth like, like in the case of the protein, they're, they're, they're characterized by these pulses. Okay, so specifically, I showed you the smooth protein oscillations that people measure at the single cell level. And what our measurements reveal is that the RNA uh, dynamics are pulse-like. There is nothing, then a pulse, nothing, a pulse, pulse, nothing, a pulse. So you could even define an amplitude, a duration, and a period of these pulses, okay? But they look very different from the smooth protein oscillations. Now, are they consistent? Well, what you can do is grab our RNA pulses run them through our model of the central dogma, and you can see that indeed, you would expect smooth protein oscillations. The, the only issue is that these protein, these pulses look a lot like the so-called transcriptional bursts that we and others have been studying for a few years and that we keep finding all throughout the tree of life, okay? So you can see here how transcription in yeast, for example, there's nothing and all of a sudden you turn on and then off and on and then off, okay? Same thing in mammals, mammalian cells and in flies. The issue is that these bursts tend to be stochastic, okay? And so if these oscillations are generated by these transcriptional bursts, okay, by, you know, like it's hard to imagine that a stochastic process can give rise to regular oscillations that then would give rise to the smooth protein oscillations that we looked at, okay? So I just showed you how these little, that how each one of these dots oscillates or the transcription of each one of these dots oscillates in a pulse-like fashion. And we're hypothesizing that maybe these guys are, 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 are generated by transcriptional bursts. But if so, you know, how do you think about the, the stochasticity, the noise that is driven by those bursts? So to understand that better, what we had to do is not just look at one cell, but be able to track all of the cells as the development progresses to understand how the cells work together in order to, at the tissue level, give you the pattern of gene expression that in, in space and time that leads to some intergenesis, okay? And to make that possible, to see at the, to look at the, to look at the, the transcriptional dynamics at the tissue-wide level, you need to measure transcription at the tissue-wide level. And the problem is that, so at this point, we were still using confocal microscopes that we use for the fruit flies that can only image a very small region of the embryo, okay? So Bruno and Brandon had to stay there overnight, moving the field of view a, every, a little bit every, every minute just to track that wave. So th this doesn't skip. Fortunately, our collaborator, Lloyd Royer at the BioHub, uh, is an expert at building these light, light sheet microscopes, okay? 
And these these things are pretty amazing because you can see the whole prismatic mesoderm, also, almost the whole animal, now with subcellular resolution. Okay. So right now I'm not showing you the spots. I'm only going to show you the cells. Remember they're labeled fluorescently. What I want you to notice is this is the tail bud. This is the end of the tail bud. This is the notochord. So that's separated in two halves of the of the tail bud. Or again, we're focusing on the prismatic mesoderm. And all I want you to see is how we can see the whole development progressing. You can see the somites appear here. Okay, you see some blinking, and that corresponds to these skin cells that were annoying that I showed you in the beginning that were removing computationally. Okay, so you know this is all obviously just the first step. You need to be able to track each one of these cells uh, as a function of time. And fortunately, Giordano uh, Bragantini in, in Loic's lab had developed a machine learning method to um, to be able to track these cells. Okay, so here what I'm doing is I'm color coding each nucleus. Okay, such that if you see no flickering. That means that we did a good job at tracking. And you do see some flickering. Some of it comes from the, um, some of it co still comes from the skin cells. Some of it comes from issues with um, with tracking that we can fix manually later. But you know, this is this it, it adds all sorts of new complications. You know, the data that we're used to dealing with is a few gigabytes, and now we're dealing with like data sets of you know one terabyte, two terabytes. So it's like and millions of cells that you need to segment. So it's pretty amazing that your DAO's uh, algorithm does such a good job. Okay. Anyway, so so far I showed you the tracking of all these cells, but obviously we're also looking at the spots within one each one of those cells. The problem is that to visualize this, those dots are too are very small with respect to the to the overall field of view. So you're not going to be able to see them, at least in this zoom level. But what you can do is you can color code each nucleus according to the fluorescence of the spot within it. Okay. So when I see very low transcription levels, I'm going to color the nucleus in magenta. When I see high levels of transcription, I'm going to color code the nucleus in yellow. Okay, and so this is what happens when when you do that uh, labeling scheme. So what you can indeed see the pulses, right? You see things turning on and off in a salt and pepper fashion, but you see that there's some wave like you know there's some propagation of those um, there of those pulses throughout the throughout the axis of the embryo. Okay, but you know it doesn't look quite like the movies I showed you earlier on from Andy. So you know. We still can measure protein and RNA at the same time, but what we can do is we can grab the measured RNA levels, RNA dynamics, and predict what the protein dynamics would be by integrating through the central dogma. So on the left, I'm going to show you the same movie of transcription that I showed you in the previous slide. On the right, I'm going to show you the predicted amount of HER1 protein given the transcription that we're measuring. Okay? So, and what I want you to see is now how we're getting these smooth protein oscillations that at least qualitatively look like the ones that Andy and other people can see. Okay. All right. So I just showed you that despite each nucleus transcribing in a, in a pulse-like fashion that looks a little bit stochastic, when you integrate the, over space and time to look at the protein pattern, you can get the sort of smooth oscillations that, that we're used to in, uh, in other measurements of semitogenesis. What I want to do now is take a step back and try to ask, okay, Given that we see these seemingly stochastic pulses, you know, if they're organized, if they're bursts, how do you make them not so stochastic that you can get a protein pattern? And can can we understand the molecular mechanism by which these uh, these pulses arise? Okay. So I told you that this kind of smelt of these protein bursts. So let me tell you a little bit more about these bursts. So the simplest model to which you can project this this bursting phenomenology is the so-called two-state model where you're going to posit that the promoter can switch between being an on-off and an on-state, okay? When in the on-state, it transcribes. It can transcribe. So if you can measure the rate of polymerase loading as a function of time, you would see this pulse-like fashion, these bursts of transcription with a given duration, frequency, and amplitude that is given by these model parameters, by K on, K off, and off, okay? So can bursting support oscillations? Well, what you can do is ask, well, let's, let's simulate this. Let's do a stochastic simulation. This is a stochastic simulation. And I can measure the period between each burst, okay? And if this could give me oscillations, if I plotted the distribution of periods, I would expect that distribution to be center peaked around a, a given defined period, okay? But when you measure your simulation, what you see, not surprisingly, is that there's a very broad distribution of periods along the, uh, uh, from just bursting, okay? So clearly transcriptional bursting by itself cannot give rise to, to, to a defined period, cannot give rise to robust, robust oscillations. But 
The idea is that bursting doesn't act alone, that transcription factors can regulate bursting. For example, repressors can act by decreasing the burst amplitude, decreasing the burst frequency, or, uh, or increasing um, uh, or increasing the, the, the sorry, or the increasing K-off, which means making the burst duration uh, small, okay? Not only that, remember that the repressor can undergo feedback, right? The re this repressor feeds back into itself. So what happens when we incorporate these aspects into the model? For example, what happens if I assume that the repressor decreases the burst frequency? I can now run the simulation again with some reasonable parameters and measure the period. And here's the distribution of periods measured in the case of bursts not being regulated. And you can see that once you have feedback of the onto the burst, so regulation of the bursts, now you can start having a narrowing of your distribution of periods. Okay, why is this exciting? Well, it's not just exciting because you can qualitatively explain it, but also the, the, the phenomenology, but also because it might shed light on the molecular nature of the regulation. What do I mean by this? Imagine, I just showed you that, you know, one scenario is that the repressor feeds back on, its, on itself by regulating the burst frequency. In that case, now what you can measure in our simulations is the distribution of active and inactive uh, intervals. Like how long do you stay in the active state? How long do you stay in the inactive state? If you posited that the repressor works by decreasing burst amplitude, then note that the distributions of active and inactive intervals are different, okay? And you would get a yet a different signature if the repressor worked by decreasing burst uh, duration, okay? So the idea is that each scenario seems to have a unique signature, okay? So now what we're doing is trying to compare these theoretical predictions to the data. And these are early days, so this is all, you need to take all of this with a grain of salt. But this is the prediction of the distributions if the repressor controls the burst duration. And this is what we measure. So at least qualitatively, it looks like out of the three scenarios, the burst, the burst, uh, the repressor is controlling burst duration. Okay. All right. I'm done. So let me just let me just take a step back. You know, I started talking to you about you know this challenge of reaching a predictive understanding of the developmental decision making. You know, could I, and and more specifically, can I can I actually use these sort of regulatory diagrams in order to predict the, the dynamics of the developmental process in space and time, okay? And, and you know, we started with a simple theoretical model, and also I showed you how we developed tools in order to engage in the theory experiment dialogue. And what we learned is that the simple model was wrong or insufficient, and that you need to account for this bursting phenomenology, and, and, and that if you do, and if you include feedback, you can explain how these stochastic bursts are organized by repression in order to give you robust oscillations at the protein level, okay? Of course, there's all sorts of interesting challenges, I think. Like, you know, HER1 is not the only oscillatory gene, for example. There's another gene that is right next to HER1 that oscillates, and you can delete one, and the, and the, and the fish still, you know, can develop its own. So they seem to be redundant. Not only that, you have two, you have these two guys, and then they can be replicated if you're after, mito after the genome duplication. So you might have four genes that all have the same period, but they need to stay synchronized. So how do they stay synchronized in, within a cell? Further, you have cells that are next to each other, and they also are synchronized at the tissue level through notch delta signaling. So the other question that we're very interested in is how, how can you incorporate this sort of synchronization into a, 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 between different cells into the theoretical models, and what sort of predictions do they make? Okay. All right. So so before I finish, let me just, just give a plug. You know, I showed you how we're, you know, like what all of this was enabled by these technologies that we developed in order to light up the processes of the central dogma. We spearheaded them in flies and many labs are using them, you know, in, in, in the context of so many of them in the context of collaborations. I show you an example of how we've extended these technologies to fish. We've extended, we've also applied them in flies. We're working on them in worms. We've done them in embryonic stem cells. And, and they led to all sorts of interesting publications. And, but the reason I'm, I'm saying this is, is not because to, I want to brag or anything like that, but because I want to make, make it clear that we're committed to a growing and nurturing a, a vibrant community of quantitative developmental biologists. So, you know, we host people in the lab that when they want to learn about our techniques, we share reagents before they're published. So if you have any questions, if you're interested in thinking about these approaches in your particular organism, just contact me and I'll be very happy to talk to you. Okay. So with that, let me just remind you, this work was spearheaded by Elizabeth Eck, Brandon Schloman, and Bruno Moretti in my lab with the hope of, uh, help of Andy Oates and Lloyd Royer. And I also need to thank my lab. That is a fantastic group of, uh, of people to do science with, these funding sources that give us the freedom uh, to pursue the questions that we're interested in. 
and all of you for your time and I'll be very happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anand. Uh, I want to just thank you on behalf of the audience. Uh, that was a beautiful talk and that data is amazing. So uh, I see one uh, question in the chat uh, from Sandeep Chaube. Uh, very nice work, curious if it's possible to tune HER1 expression systematically and compare your model predictions with the data. Also, is the on-off model the, mo the, the, mo the model that, cap that best captures the data? Sorry, Sandeep, I just edited your question a bit. Hey, Sandeep, show yourself. I haven't seen you in ages. Anyway, thank you. Nice to see you, man. Anyway. Hey, uh... hey Adnan. The work is fantastic. I just I just wanted to attend the talk anyway. So yeah, yeah, yeah. No, of course, of course. Good no, you. So, yeah. um, to tune her expression systematically and compare you. Yes, I mean, that would be fun. Uh, I think you would need some sort of a genetic approach. Uh, maybe maybe we can change levels and all of that. Honestly, the, the problem right now is that the technology up until a few months ago was when you put a construct, it goes randomly into the genome. So every time you make a new construct, you, like it, the levels are not reproducible. Just now, recently, people have developed ways of having landing sites in the in fish. And now I think we can start playing with those sorts of things where you tune like strengths of promoters and all of that in a reproducible fashion. Okay. So yes, that's all on our radar screen. And mostly we're limited by the technology that we had available, but that's changing now, though it takes you know a few months to make new fish and all of that. Um, so whether the most the on-off model is the, the, the model that captures most of the data, I think it's the model that is the simplest model that I can come up with. There's a whole industry of uh, model selection schemes that you know where some people think well there's more 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 states, more off states, more on states, and all of that. We have not engaged in that sort of, of model selection yet. And the times that we've done it, we I haven't been too convinced, at least with our data, that we can do that model selection. So right now, I'm just going for the simplest possible model. Thanks, Anna. There's a question from Amrita. Uh, this is a great prediction from the theory. I wanted to know whether you tested other kinds of negative feedback in the model to test for goodness, go goodness of fit with experiments. Could the inhibition come from an independently expressed inhibitor, or does it have to be the protein translated from the HER1 mRNA itself? Ah, no, it could be some other protein. It could be some other protein, it's true. Uh, but it would have to oscillate on a, like, they would have to bring in the pace of oscillation, right? And we actually know that HER1 binds in the vicinity, it binds here. Actually, see this intergenic region between HER7 and HER1? The two genes are like this. And this this is populated with sites for HER1 and HER7. So the simplest model is one of, of uh, where that's the inhibitor. But the cool thing about our system that we can do next is we can kill the protein using, you know, a crispants or, you know, using morpholinos and still see the transcription. So we actually have the tools to test whether the, it's, it is the inhibition that is of, by, of the repressor itself that is driving the oscillations. And that's one experiment that we're doing right now. Uh, yes.